All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. And welcome to our program entitled Doors Wide Open, Advancing Inclusive Access to Special Collections, co-hosted by SCA, which is the Society for California Archivists, and ALIGN, which stands for the Academic Librarians Interest Group North of CARL, which stands for the California Academic and Research Libraries. I'm Alex Norton, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the archivist for the Center for Archival Research and Training at UC Santa Cruz and the current membership director of SCA. I'd like to thank the co-organizers of this webinar, uh, Ken Lyons and Rachel Jaffe from UC Santa Cruz, as well as Hesper Wilson from San Francisco State University. And before we get started with this webinar, I'd like to ask everyone to take a moment of awareness and grounding in the land that each of us are currently inhabiting. Uh, the land from which I join you today is the unceded territory of the Uwazwa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsun tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the central coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. And we recognize that all of us are joining this session from different places in California and beyond. And we encourage all attendees to acknowledge the original stewards of the land which they inhabit. You can look up your location on websites such as native-land.ca to learn more about these original stewards of the land that you're on. And we are very excited to hear from presenters from four different institutions today around California about their approaches to increasing access to special collections materials. And I'd like to thank them for being here today and sharing their expertise with us. These speakers are Kelsey Boffman McDowell and Aaron Laufen from Santa Clara University, Jackie Becky and Maggie Hughes from the Huntington Library, Sandy Enriquez from UC Riverside, and Michaela Ullman from the University of Southern California. And I just have a few items to cover before we get started. Uh, first, the schedule. We'll have presentations of about 10 minutes for each institution. Then we were going to have a short break, followed by about 20 minutes of moderated Q&A and discussion with our panelists, and we'll be ending at 12 p.m. Pacific. These uh, four presentations will be recorded, but we will stop the recording after the presentations before the Q&A session. If you'd like to be part of the conversation during the webinar, you may use the chat feature. Just please be aware that your chat messages may show up in the recording. If you have a question during the presentation, you can use the Q&A feature of Zoom, which is located at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to upvote a question in this Q&A module. If you see an existing question you like, you can also ask questions anonymously. And we will be holding all questions until the end of the session but you may enter them at any time into this module. There is a live transcript feature available for this session. Just click on live transcript at the bottom of your screen and you can choose to view either captioning along the bottom or a dynamic transcript on the side of your screen. Please note that this transcript is automatically generated and may not be completely accurate during the session. We will be reviewing the transcript for accuracy before we make it and the video recording available later. And last but not least, by participating in this forum today, you are agreeing to abide by the codes of conduct of both SCA and CARL. And the links to those will be put in the chat momentarily if you'd like to review them. Thank you. Okay, so let's get started with our first pair of presenters from Santa Clara University. Kelsey Boffin McDowell is the Research and Instruction Services Coordinator for Archives and Special Collections at Santa Clara University Library. She holds an MLIS from San Jose State University and an MFA in writing from USF. Erin Laufen is the University Archivist and Historical Records Manager at Santa Clara University, where she is responsible for the management and coordination of activities in the university archives, as well as the care and management of archival collections in the Archives and Special Collections Department. Erin holds a bachelor's degree in modern literature from UC Santa Cruz, go slugs, and an MLIS from San Jose State University. Take it away. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today at the Carl Align Virtual Conference. We're really happy to be here. Um, 
Sorry about that. My screen appears to be frozen. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Okay, before we begin. Erin, we can't see the presentation. You cannot? No. One moment. Sorry about that. Here we go. So sorry, everybody. There we go. My apologies. Looks good. Thank you. Thank you. So before we begin, let us pause to acknowledge that Santa Clara University sits on the land of the Ohlone and Mwekma Ohlone people. We remember their continued con connection to this region and give thanks to them for allowing us to live, work, learn, and pray on their traditional homeland. We offer our respect to their elders and to all Ohlone people of the past and present. My name is Erin Laughlin and I am the University Archivist and Historical Records Manager at the Department of Archives and Special Collections at Santa Clara University. I will be co-presenting today Hi, I'm Kelsey Boffman McDowell, and I'm the Research and Instruction Services Coordinator for Archives and Special Collections. So the purpose of our talk today is to recognize and address archival omissions in Archives and Special Collections Mission Santa Clara Manuscript Collection, an action that is just as important as promoting access to what's represented in our institutional current holdings. Today, I'm going to be giving an introduction to SCU's Mission Santa Clara Manuscript Collection, giving examples of patrons' expectations of what the collection holds, discussing the concept of a null curriculum, or in our case, a null archives, and how it relates to Ohlone representation in the Mission Manuscripts Collection, and addressing the issues of silence, elision, and erasure in the collection. The Mission Manuscript Collection at Santa Clara is one of the most historically significant collections at our university. Unlike many of the other Franciscan missions of Alta California, which were abandoned after secularization, Mission Santa Clara was able to maintain and preserve a majority of its records and library. This is because when the Franciscan friars turned the mission over and its remaining grounds over to the Jesuits, in 51, 1851 to start Santa Clara College, the manuscripts in the library were included. As a result, Santa Clara University holds the largest extant collection of mission era materials aside from Mission Santa Barbara. Sorry, my screen. There we go, so sorry. Over the past 10 years at SCU, I've given many presentations about the Mission Santa Clara Manuscript Collection. And no matter the topic or the audience, whether it's a general overview of the collection or speaking to alumni about the history of the university, there's always the moment when I'm asked the question, where's the Sarah stuff? Well, What it really means is, where are the stories? Where's the evidence? Where's the proof? And my answer is, it isn't here. At least not that we know of. Despite the persistent refrain that it has to be there, there comes a time when we as scholars, researchers, and students must realize that we want to, that what we want to be there simply may not exist. Or perhaps more importantly, it may not exist in the format we want or are used to. And this is where the concept of a null curriculum, or in our case, a null archives comes in. So what is a null curriculum or a null archives and how does it relate to the mission manuscripts collection? Briefly defined as 
not contain or retain for a variety of reasons is just as significant as what they do. For example, here is the name Clara, which although faded with age, we can just make out in the image with the red circle around it. From the collection sacramental records, we know that this was the first baby christened by the friars. She was given the name Clara by the founder of Mission Santa Clara, Fray Tomas de la Pena in 1777. We know by her burial record that she died young at 10 or possibly age 16. We also know the names of her parents. Her father was Sao Nem and her mother was called Toma Linquis. The records also indicate that her father passed away without being baptized, while her mother was baptized and died in 1784. But the trail seems to end there. So many questions remain. Who was Clara? What was her life like? Aaron, are you there? Oh no, it seems like she froze out. Oh no. Okay, well, we will wait for her to get back. Um, ah, the joys of Zoom. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, if we could give her a minute to see if she could come back, that'd be cool. But otherwise, yeah. I could just try to take over the presentation. She just had a couple more slides to go through. Okay, yeah, we have time. Let's give it another minute or so. I really want to know who Clara was. Yep, we definitely, we all do. Um, <laughs> that's, that's kind of what we're getting towards, you know. There's, yeah, so many questions remain. Yeah. Okay, well, I, yeah, I really want to know about Clara and Null Archives, as Lisa said in the chat. Um, Kelsey, do you want to go ahead with your presentation and then we can hopefully get back to Erin uh, when she gets back? Yeah, one second. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. We have all been there, it's true. Kelsey, do you have the slides? Um, yeah. Oh, great. Um, I do, but if you could share them, that would be cool. Yeah, I can. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're on slide six, if you could go forward. All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Yes, so as Aaron was saying, um, you know, there's all these questions that remain about Clara. And we're, you know, we know these this information about who her parents were. And we know like when she died and when she was baptized, but that's where the story ends. And so that's really the represent, that's what Null Archives is, or like a Null History is, where it's there, not there. And it's a really common thing for indigenous experiences in California and in the, in the archives and in the mission um, archives. 
um, because they're told from the colonial settler perspective and their ways of record keeping and the oral tradition are usually a non-material culture. And so, you know, they exist outside of what happened at the mission and the colonialists and the Spanish uh, Padres were not interested in saving those types of materials. And so what we're wondering is, you know, do local Lo Ohlone community members, have they passed the story of Clara through generations? And if they haven't passed Clara's story through, maybe they've passed other similar individual stories that lived during the mission era. Um, next slide, please. And so in order to kind of address this lack of representation in the archive, we want to start critically engaging with the people in our own backyard. And we want to start having an open dialogue with the Ohlone members in our area. And, um, you know, it's just at this point that we need to stop and listen to see what they have to say. And we also have to face the realization that they may not want to talk to us. They may not want to talk about the mission era experiences of their ancestors. They may want to talk about something later or before. And um, those are all things that we need to be open to discovering as we engage in this conversation. Uh, next slide, please. And so we have this quote from scholars Ricolette and Johnson and Hutt. We might ask settler audiences to sit with or dwell in these effective spaces to engage with narratives that consider the possibility of one's disappearance, narratives that indigenous peoples have had to deal with for a very long time. Indigenous populations have had to engage with symbolic and material realities, violences that have vanished their bodies and foreclosed their possible futures for centuries. And they continue to deal with these realities on a daily basis. Next slide, please. So setting all of that up, um, the, the main question is, you know, what are we going to do about it? And so from my perspective, as the research and instruction services coordinator, um, I give instruction to the students in, in the university about the mission manuscripts and the mission era. And we have a lot of archaeology archaeology professors that are doing research in this area. And then the students come up to me later and they say, oh, I want your help finding this ideal Ohlone artifact created in this one specific period of time um, that shows their viewpoint about this one specific historical issue. And I have to say, nope, it doesn't exist. Um, and if it does, SCU doesn't have it. And I really want to help these students and connect them with these materials. But there's these ethical questions of what SCU should have and what we shouldn't have. So from my perspective as a public services person, working towards access includes working towards representation and there is a right way to do representation. So we cannot fill the silences that Aaron was discussing with what's in the mission manuscripts collection. We need to speak to surviving members and we have to stand on the shoulders of giants tapping into the work already done by the scholars and archeologists at SCU and leaders of local Ohlone groups and most recently by the Ohlone History Working Group. Next slide, please. So for some background, the Ohlone History Working Group uh, was a committee formed by the former president of Santa Clara in 2019 with the charge to better identify ways to acknowledge the history of the Ohlone at Mission Santa Clara in a spirit of truth and reconciliation and this group consisted of SCU scholars and leaders as well as local leaders of Ohlone groups. And um, once the report was delivered this past summer in 2020, um, there's just basically been this groundswell of energy and, act, and action around this issue. And so while Aaron and I were not um, consulted in the writing of the report, Archives and Special Collections is represented. And so we're super excited to just take advantage of the mo momentum that's going. Uh, next slide, please. So on the heels of this report, Aaron and I have come up with our own specific objectives um, using our own creativity and critical thinking. So one, we want people who identify as Ohlone as well as Native American scholars to feel comfortable doing research in archives and special collections, while also we also have to pay attention to the balancing of the preservation needs for the materials. And so that means that sometimes I have to insist that people use the digital surrogates when possible. And we want these same people to be incorporated into the intellectual life of the library. So we want them to do presentations, attend our events and more. 
The building in which the SCU library stands is called the Learning Commons. And so in this spirit of the commons, we want to achieve the culture of dialogue, openness, and interaction. And of course, unpaid labor for, for Bioloni to beat these gains is not acceptable. So our challenge in really in the current COVID climate is identifying funding to remunerate Aloni for their contributions. Next slide. So over the last several months, we've been identifying and applying for several grants in order to meet these aims. And we were recently awarded a Bannon Mission Integration Grant, which is internal to SCU. And because of this and the monies that it provides, we are now able to start moving forward planning a summer and fall speaker series um, on the topic of the ways in which family held archives in the Ohlone community are being used for cultural revitalization and education. And we're going to record these panels and add the recordings to the archival record. So rather than rushing to add Ohlone artifacts or oral histories or other things created by Ohlone members to the SU archives, where they may not belong and where it may not be ethical to keep them, we see incorporating Ohlone perspectives into the archival record as simply preserving the product of active collaboration and dialogue. So by using this idea of the intellectual commons to engage with our Ohlone interlocutors, the process becomes the product. And then later down the road, we would like to tap into some of the other recommendations from the Ohlone History Working Group report, like doing oral histories, but that would involve applying for larger grants to fund a project archivist position for this. And so first things first, we'll make some connections, um, start a dialogue, see if we can have a relationship, and then we'll see what's next after that. Next slide, please. So this is our bibliography. Um, in the third one there, the link goes to um, the digital collections of the mission manuscripts if you want to take a, a, a look. And that's actually part of a bigger Ohlone research guide in Santa Clara that I created. And so there's information about the Ohlone History Working Group there as well. And then um, next slide. Otherwise, we're looking forward to the Q&A at the end of the session. Thank you for bearing with our technology problems. And we're doing a whole panel on this at SCA in April. So if you're signed up for the SCA conference, look us up on April 27th, and we'd love to see you there. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Kelsey, and thank you, Erin. That was really great. Um, now we are going to hear from Jackie and Maggie at the Huntington. So as the Huntington's research, Reader Services Librarian, Jackie Becky provides support for advanced research in the humanities, develops outreach initiatives for the library, and manages projects that leverage digital library technologies to enhance user experience. After earning an MLIS from St. Catherine University in 2013, she worked at the Minnesota Historical Society as a reference librarian. In that role, she provided archival research instruction and developed outreach strategies to assist local tribal communities in building their archives. She is highly motivated by connecting collections and communities, especially when she can help empower a new community of users. And Maggie Hughes is the archival processing manager within the acquisitions, cataloging, and metadata department of the Huntington Library. She leads a team of archivists dedicated to processing archival collections, manuscripts, and visual materials. Current projects include a survey of archival collections, implementing archive space, and updating policies and workflows. She's previously held positions at UCLA, the Getty Research Institute, and UCSF, and she earned a master's in information science from the University of Michigan. Thank you, Maggie and Jackie. Thanks, Alex, and thanks for um for uh, inviting us to be part of this panel. And thank you, Kelsey and Erin, for the amazing presentation. That was so thought-provoking and great. Um, so again, my name is Jackie Becky. I'm a Reader Services Librarian at the Huntington. And I'm joined by Maggie Hughes, who's the Archival Processing Manager at the Huntington. And we're really glad to be here today. We want to begin by saying that the Huntington respectfully acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many nations and on the ancestral lands of the Tongva and Keech Nation people, who continue to call this region home. We pay our respects to the indigenous ancestors of this place. Maggie and I are both excited to be here today to join this crucial discussion surrounding access at special collections and our work at the Huntington Library, who has a reputation of being an exclusive space for research, aspects of which are both perceived and actual. 
We will discuss work being done at the Huntington to shift the culture in small ways and in bigger ways, and how COVID-19 has really been a blessing in disguise for making the library a more inclusive space by radically shifting the work we do for the better. The Huntington is an independent collections-based research and educational institution located in greater, greater Los Angeles. For many decades, the heart of the library's operation was the use of collections in the reading rooms and fostering an exclusive research community of readers and fellows, systems that were based on academic degrees earned, references, and applications. Five years ago, the Huntington started making efforts to move away from its legacy of privileging elite scholars and began working to initiate a full service library model that includes remote reference services, allowing access to patrons who didn't meet the reader qualifications and standardized collections management practices. Jackie and I have both been at the Huntington um, for about two years now and were brought on as part of these changes in philosophy. Shifting the Huntington service philosophy has required changes in our work culture, people processes and our perceptions of ourselves, some of which has occurred and some of which is still very much underway. And while some of the work we'll be describing may seem foundational, it has been a radical shift for the Huntington. We are hopeful that this work will lead to greater change down the road. With library closure this past year due to COVID, the Reader Services Department quickly mobilized to wholly embrace what might be possible in terms of access and remote reference services, which has led to democratizing ways of accessing materials via an expanded online experience to welcome people to our collections. This year, we designed several new virtual services to meet people where they're at and to remove barriers to access. We've begun offering a virtual reading room service, which allows patrons to view rare materials remotely via a high resolution document camera. These sessions are bookable by appointment and are hosted via Zoom for one hour. Anyone can book a virtual reading room session at no cost, and the service removes barriers of time, travel, and reader application processes for accessing our resources. We've also developed a chat reference service and a series of how to do remote research lib guides, such as a library at home guide, which outlines digital library resources and services. In preparation for reopening, the library is currently overhauling our workflow from welcoming people to the library and usage of the reading room by moving to an appointment-based model and creating tools for empowering new visitors. We've designed an online appointment system for in-person visits using the calendaring system LibCal hosted by SpringShare, which provides patrons with seamless access to prepare for your visit tools and materials outlining what to expect when you arrive. These tools aim to reduce library anxiety by empowering researchers before they walk in the door and setting them up with a positive experience. By moving to an appointment system, we are departing from old researcher access categories that emphasize degrees earned and letters of recommendation and are moving towards a welcoming people to the library process that broadens access and provides a wider spectrum of opportunities. Driving traffic to the reading room solely for primary source use via appointments that streamline the research process while simultaneously providing enhanced online library experiences via virtual instruction, online help, and virtual reading room access. In anticipation of broadening our patron base, we are overhauling our digital platforms, which we see as a start here portal for all library experiences. And to enhance access and create a more unified digital library experience this past year, the library has begun a project to design a standalone website during COVID, we recognized that remote research and digital library visits were requiring a fuller library experience via our website, where services and staff expertise are discoverable in the same environment as collections. As we broaden our patrons audience, it is crucial we amplify pathways for discovering and contextualizing the library's collections for a diverse community of researchers. And to achieve this, the library has begun instituting a discovery layer or an all-inclusive search solution, which will be integrated into our website and launched later this spring. The Huntington has found that research guides hosted on the SpringShare platform LibGuides can be powerful tools for empowering users and improving accessibility. As I mentioned earlier, we've been using the LibGuides platform as a space to provide researchers with step-by-step -step instructions on how to plan for their visit and use our library. LibGuides also assists users with navigating our complex resources by leading the, the uh, user through the process of researching a specific topic in a systematic step-by-step -step way, making use of the best finding tools the library has to offer. LibGuides has also provided us with opportunities to recontextualize collections and provide language inclusivity and multilingual content. 
We are not only making the library more accessible through the web and discovery tools, we are also diversifying our audience and making the library a more welcoming space through virtual instruction and a library webinar series. These outreach, outreach and instruction programs have opened the door for new audiences, such as lifelong learners, hobbyists, younger students, and K-12 educators to engage with our collections. During library closure this past year, the Reader Services Department developed an outreach initiative, which we're calling the Multi-Story Library Webinar Series, that utilizes digital storytelling to democratize access to deep knowledge, usually reserved for registered readers in one-on-one -on -one meetings with curators, that articulates the value of library labor through a panel presentation format that highlights all the behind scenes work that highlights well, uh, to make collections accessible and equips our diverse public audience with digital skills to become citizen scholars. We're really looking forward to seeing how this program will grow in the months ahead. And with that, I'm going to pass the virtual mic over to Maggie. Our reader services department almost always has the first interactions with our patrons, but Jackie and I try to collaborate and communicate regularly to align key initiatives between our departments. Behind the scenes, I'm involved with efforts to make the library's collections more inclusive and accessible. One way we're doing this is by continuing to update our content and structure metadata and ensure they align with current best practices and national and international standards. We're also uh, reevaluating local practices that could be barriers to entry for both new patrons and new staff. Following professional standards allows researchers to find and understand our collections the same way they do in other research libraries. Furthermore, up-to-date metadata practices put us in a better position to share our metadata more broadly, which could include migrating more easily to new software in the future, sharing our collections in aggregator websites and databases and crosswalking it to other metadata standards. So some examples of this include, um, we recently completed a review and update of our description elements to ensure that they're DAX compliant and other relevant standards. We are implementing uh, culturally competent description standards, um, such as actively using the anti-racist description guidelines to inform new description work. And we are planning a reparative description project to identify offensive or biased language for analysis and remediation. We're in the very early stages of planning that, um, trying to be thoughtful and make sure that the effort is sustainable. We've built scaffolding to support the ongoing improvement and maintenance of our metadata by establishing and normalizing systems to give feedback on metadata in a centrally documented place. From there, archivists and catalogers can investigate and resolve the issues. So far, we've successfully done this internally. All feedback gets mediated by a library staff member. Um, looking forward, it's a goal to encourage more feedback from our user communities by adding links in our catalog. Reader services would likely then triage the information and submit it to us through the existing feedback mechanism. And the library currently does not provide access to um, unprocessed collections in the reading room. Even so, we're working on gradually changing the culture around unprocessed collections. And we're doing this by providing more detailed responses to reference questions about unprocessed collections. Um, this can include explaining our policy around unprocessed collections that we consider demand when determining processing priorities, setting users' expectations around when a collection might open if we know, or letting them know that there are no current plans for processing. Um, how to tell when a collection is opened and welcoming them to check back in in the future to see if anything has changed. We are tracking interest in non-processed collections so that we can start using user demand data to inform our processing priorities and implementing a processing prioritization rubric and framework so that we have criteria and process in which to consider the user demand data. And we're working on getting collection level catalog records for all of our collections online. We know of over 400 collections totaling over 6,500 linear feet that do not have a record in our OPAC. And lastly, generally getting a better understanding of what is needed by reader services staff in order to serve material to patrons. So what's the baseline of what they need to serve a collection? What kind of training or discussion would be needed to orient staff and users to minimally process collections? and how could we adjust our accessioning procedures to meet some of these needs. So a lot of what we're doing um, is very foundational. Repositories within larger academic contexts may have done some of this already or have extra support. Uh, we see the work we're involved with as getting everything in order so that we can make bigger changes 
uh, Tenma Okun's White Supremacy Culture from DismantlingRacism.org says that structure cannot in and of itself facilitate or prevent abuse. So we know that even with a foundational structure in place, there's a lot of additional work to create an inclusive and access-driven environment. We are continuing to consider how we can build a sustainable community of practice on these issues moving forward. Thank you, Maggie and Jackie. Okay, now we will hear from Sandy at UC Riverside. Sandy Enriquez is the Special Collections Public Services Outreach and Community Engagement Librarian at UC Riverside. She holds an MA in Latin American Studies from New York University and an MLIS from Long Island University. Her research interests include fandom culture, BIPOC speculative fiction, and archives as sites for Indigenous and Latinx community empowerment. Thank you, Sandy. Oh, Sandy, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I totally I remember to put on the video, but not the unmute. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's a pleasure to participate in this panel and to be able to share some of the work that we've been doing at UC Riverside. Um, so as Alex mentioned, my name is Sandy Enriquez, and today I'm speaking to you from the ancestral lands of the Cahuilla, Tongva, Luiseño, and Serrano peoples. As a member of UCR, I want to recognize our responsibility to these original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air. So today I'll be sharing with you my experiences and approach to student-centered outreach at UCR Special Collections and University Archives, or SCUA. While the pandemic has had a significant impact on our work, I'm happy to say that we've still had some great successes and learned a lot through this experimental process. I will be highlighting two of our outreach events today, one pre-pandemic and one post-pandemic, to share the practices that we've been implementing to be more inclusive to students. So to start, I'd like to give you a little bit more information about my own background and positionality. So I am Peruvian American, Indigenous Latinx, and first generation. I attended graduate school at New York University, and I was on a fellowship to study my ancestral language of Quechua. It was through that experience that I became really involved with the local Andean, Indigenous, and Latinx communities. And as a student, I was organizing all kinds of outreach events that highlighted things like language, culture, film, et cetera. And here I've shared some photos from a few of those events, as well as flyers from other events that I put together. Doing this type of outreach as a student was really transformative and powerful for me. I often felt like I was this bridge between the library and the university world and local communities. And I share this information because I think that those experiences that I had as a graduate student have influenced the way that I approach outreach in my professional capacity today. And as a fairly recent student myself, I know quite well the hesitation that community members or BIPOC students may feel when accessing the library or the university, let alone special collections and archives. I'm also an early career professional, and this is my first uh, job outside of library school. I've only been in it for a year, and at this point, I've been working remotely longer than I have on site. My position as the public services, outreach, and community engagement librarian is also new at my inst institution, and I am the first person to hold it meaning that I am often the first person that the library from the library to cultivate these particular relationships and connections. But I'm thrilled to be in this role because to me, it embodies the spirit of critical archival studies and the call to decolonize our field. So the first, uh, the first outreach event that I'll highlight was tentatively called Costo Cafe, Comics, Manga, and More. And I say tentatively because this event was actually scheduled for April, 2020. So it was unfortunately canceled at the beginning of the pandemic but I still wanna highlight it because I consider it a success in other ways. This event was in collaboration with UCR's Native American Student Programs or NASP. Our goal was to create a one day event mimicking a pop-up manga cafe where students could browse graphic novels, comics and manga from our special collections. And in addition to this pop-up cafe, there would be a series of scholarly talks about indigenous and diverse representation in popular media. The implicit exclusivity and intimidation factor of special collections was something that I discussed at length with my NASP collaborators, and they understood it because they themselves felt it to a degree. So based on successful initiatives in the past, there were several ways that we designed this event in the hopes that it would help demystify special collections and break down barriers for student access. 
The first is location. So we plan to host the event in outside of our reading room in an adjacent room called the Rupert and Jeanette Costo Library of the American Indian, hence Costo Cafe. This was practical because we needed to keep the reading room open for researchers, but we, it, was, it was also intentional because we wanted to pick a place that students recognized and felt comfortable in. The Costo room is frequently used as a study space, and it's also a gathering spot for our Native American studies students. So there's already a sense of familiarity and student ownership of that space. Secondly, and inherently embodied by this partnership is an emphasis on collaboration and reciprocity. So whenever possible, I like to collaborate with other campus or community institutions in my outreach events. But I find that, that this is especially useful when it comes to reaching students. In this case, NASP is a program that works closely with students and has more casual day-to-day -day interaction with them than we tend to in special collections. So having their name or their logo on a flyer can be the main factor that encourages students to attend, especially if students have no prior exposure to special collections. So although we didn't get to see this particular event come to full fruition, I still consider it a success because it's helped us cultivate an allyship and connection with NASP. Since planning that event, I've been invited to several of their own outreach events, and I always try to attend or promote those whenever I can. Again, practicing reciprocity whenever possible. And I've made some amazing connections with faculty members and students through those events that I would not have made otherwise. So in the spirit of supporting inclusive access to special collections, I'd highly urge you to consider partnering with institutions outside of your library with the goal of maintaining those partnerships through intentional reciprocity. The second event I'll highlight today was called Slash Fan Fiction in Yaoi Manga, Fandom and Sexuality in the Archives, which was held in November 2020, so well into the pandemic. The overwhelming majority of our events for the, of our attendees for this event were undergraduate students. And this was a scholarly talk based on an article that my colleague and I recently co-wrote about our unique holdings of Star Trek slash fan fiction and Japanese boys love or yaoi manga. So this event was held over Zoom and it was by far our most successful event of the year. And I think that there were two main reasons why it was so successful. The first is the student club outreach. So in addition to the outreach with support that we received from our co-sponsorships with the UCR LGBT Center, and Asian Pacific student programs, I did ample outreach to local anime and manga clubs. And word got out to other states and even other countries as well, so that was really great. And while this is a niche topic, I do think that collaborating with student groups can be successful in other areas as well. So for instance, prior to the pandemic, I organized a private and curated tour for the UCR Undergraduate Astronomy Club, and that was also a really great success. And because that event went so well, the president of that club recently reached out and asked us to collaborate again, but this time on their own outreach to K-12 K students. So now we're working with them and their faculty member to develop at least two more workshops for fourth graders and high school students that we wouldn't have been able to reach otherwise. The second reason that I think this event was so successful is that we left a lot of space for active anonymity. And by that, I mean, we gave our attendees lots of ways to interact with us anonymously and at the discretion of their comfort level. Since this event was held over Zoom, the chat function is an obvious place for participation, but it's not anonymous. And we actually used Padlet for our event, which you can see pictured here, and we used it like a message board. So we left some prompts at the top and encouraged folks to respond as they like. And while the Zoom chat was really active during the event, I would say the Padlet was even more active. And I believe that the sense of anonymity helped students be, feel more comfortable interacting with us and participating in an engaging conversation about these materials. Other ways that you might encourage active anonymity in your remote events are by using polls or word clouds or the Zoom whiteboard feature or other freeform activities online. So as you can tell by now, I really believe that focusing on partnerships and cultivating meaningful community is key to increasing student access to special collections. Since these partnerships form the foundation of my outreach strategy, I have a small checklist that I find helpful to brainstorm outreach ideas. And I feel like asking these questions helps keep me on track and helps increase the likelihood that the event will be meaningful and visible to students. So first is, is there a current or upcoming class that focuses on this topic or theme or would benefit from it? Is there a student organization or campus department that would also be invested in this topic or theme? 
And is this relevant or timely based on current events? And for does this elevate underrepresented voices and serve the needs of diverse students? For me, this last factor is particularly important because UCR has one of the most diverse student bodies in the UC system. Over half of our students identify as Latinx and a large portion of our students are also the first in their families to attend college. So to many of our students, special collections doesn't seem relevant or useful to them. It can seem like this exclusive world outside of their knowledge and comfort zone. So we need to make it relevant for them by finding connections to their stories or sharing other diverse representations whenever possible. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation for today. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I hope this information was helpful. So please feel free to reach out anytime if you'd like to chat more. And I look forward to continuing our conversation during the Q&A. Thank you, Sandy. That was great. I love that checklist. I'm definitely gonna borrow that. You're getting a lot of, a lot of love in the chat as well. Um, okay, so last but not least, we have Michaela from USC. Michaela Ullman is the Exile Studies Librarian and Instruction Coordinator at USC Libraries Department of Special Collections. She holds a Magister Artium degree in Cultural Anthropology and Archaeology from the University of Bonn in Germany and an MLAS in from San Francisco, sorry, MLAS from San Jose State University. At the USC Libraries, Michaela oversees the Fuchtwanger Memorial Library, home to Leon Fuchtwanger's invaluable 30,000 volume rare book collection as well as papers by German-speaking intellectuals and artists who fled Nazi Germany and came to Los Angeles in the 1930s and early 1940s. As instruction coordinator, she leads her department's instruction efforts, designs and facilitates primary source instruction in a wide range of subject areas, and collaborates closely with instructors on developing assignments and tools to further students' engagement with rare books and archives. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you, Alex, and thank you so much for all the organizers, all the participants. I'm already so inspired <laughs> by all the presentations we've heard. Um, so yeah, so I'll talk about advancing inclusive access um, to the UC Library Special Collections today. Um, and I'll start with the Native Land Acknowledgement. I'll talk about advancing access through targeted outreach integration of critical librarianship into instruction sessions, inclusive selection of class materials, fostering student agency, and also visions for the future. So a little bit broader, not, so, uh, not, not focusing on specific projects here, but just um, a, a broader overview. Um, but let me start with the, the native land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the UC libraries are located on the traditional homeland of the Tongva people. We pay our respect to the traditional caretakers of the land, the Tongva nation, their ancestors, elders, and relations past, present, and forthcoming. Along with the Tongva, we also recognize the Kumash, the Tatvariam, Serrano, Kawila, Huanyenyo, <laughs> Luisenyo people for the land that USC also occupies around Southern California. Oops. There we go. So um, first I want to talk about um, advancing access through targeted outreach. When I started at USC in, gosh, 2006, um, we had very few classes coming to special collections. Um, I, I love data, so I did um, assessment fairly regularly. And what you could tell, particularly after we had implemented Aeon and we could run reports, is that most of our people in the reading room were independent researchers or faculty, but we had very few students returning or even coming to the reading room. And this is as often times, you know, because of how special collections look like, they can be intimidating, the doors are closed and so on. So over the years, I started to implement various things in order to really empower more students to come to special collections and use the reading room and feel welcome. Um, so some of these things are were targeted outreach um, to faculty and also to students and um, student clubs to really empower them um, to use special collections. Um, I started to implement a more programmatic uh, approach towards instruction. So instead of doing like one-offs, I, I really tried to you know do curriculum mapping, um, trying to work with instructors on integration of special collections visits to their into their syllabi, 
Um, I started creating extra credit assignments at first because when I first arrived, uh, instructors weren't very comfortable in um, having assignments created for special collections. And this may have also, you know, been, been the, like the reason may have been that they weren't comfortable visiting special collections that much or using special collections. So we started with extra credit assignments that I designed and then the instructors just added. Um, but out of this grew, um, grew way more um, implemented um, assignments and, and instructors creating their own assignments for students having to return to special collections and use the reading room. We also, um, my colleague Sulof Chan and I received a uh, Dean's Research Grant uh, with which we uh, initiated the USC Libraries Research Award, which has a category that requires students to use primary sources from special collections. Um, I also work with my colleague, Elizabeth Galusis, our instruction um, librarian, or head of instruction, I should say, um, at the libraries on information literacy course integration grants. Uh, she started this and we just recently, two years ago, added um, a track for primary sources so that um, faculty can come and attend a course and we help them to integrate primary source literacy into, into their existing syllabi. Um, and the result of all these efforts uh, is really a huge change in who comes to our um, reading room. And you can see here um, that like the, the classes that visited uh, or visit special collections today have been constantly increasing over the years. And um, let me see on the next slide, you can see that also the number of students have been have been increasing. And this is only this is based on data from Aon, so it only counts the first visit. Uh, many students actually come more than one time, so the the numbers are higher. But these are like first visits counted. And as you can see, we have like 744 um, visits by undergraduate students in 2019. So now undergraduate students are actually our highest population. Um, represented in our reading room, which makes us super proud. Um, other things that we've been doing is also integration of critical librarianship and instruction sessions. That's something that's very important for myself. Um, so every instruction session um, that we lead includes um, uh, an active discussion of archival sciences and biases that are represented in primary source collections. Um, and we also, when we do active learning activities, when the students are doing an in-class activity, um, there's also a part, a segment of the, the activity also asks them to discuss whose perspectives are missing and what might be the reasons um, for that. So we dedicate quite a lot of time in our instruction sessions to discussing biases, our own biases as well. Um, and, and again, silences and, and, and reasons um, for that so the students are aware that not everything you know that that special collections or museums or whatever don't represent history that there's lots of gaps and silences and that there are many you know reasons for that um, we've also been trying to acquire uh, more collections that provide uh, more diverse perspectives and content um, going forward um, and then also over the over the summer um, a small working group of special collections and the One Archives has created a statement on anti-racist description for our um, archival collections, acknowledging that there may be racist, homophobic, sexist, or otherwise offensive or problematic language in our um, in our finding aids, and that we are you know, pledging to work on, on correcting that. Um, another thing that I've been trying to implement is inclusive, a uh, more inclusive selection of class materials. We all you know, know that we are selecting materials to show to students. So I'm just trying to ensure that more diverse perspectives are represented in uh, the materials that we showcase. And um, I also discuss the needs for diversifying these class materials with instructors so that together we can brainstorm for additional materials that we can bring in. Oftentimes instructors have been using the same sets of materials for a long time. So having this discussion is also trying to get their buy-in to, to open up their minds to include more perspectives. And sometimes you have to be creative to be more inclusive. I remember a music class where really, um, you know, it, it was hard to, to fit in something. I couldn't really find um, material, but um, I became aware of a, um, 
a facsimile of an Aztec codex that had um, musical instruments and I included this one in the presentation and actually this resulted in a student coming to me and inquiring about a codex and we talked about Nahuatl, the, the Aztec language, and, and he had a family background. Um, so he was super excited to see himself in these materials. So again, like sometimes if you don't have this absolutely matching piece, you may use creativity to at, at least add that, add, add, you know, a little bit more to that. Um, we're also, I've been also advocating for change in collection development and funding a distribution to securing a budget for teaching materials so that we can add additional and under, underrepresented perspectives. And I'll talk a little bit about um, that and student driven acquisition uh, in the next slide. And then again, using existing gaps and silences to proactively um, address the issue of archival silences rather than ignoring it and also rather than filling them. Like some somebody said already, like, you know, it, it may not be ethical to, feel, to, to fill every archival silences and we may not be the right institution to have every collection. And there, there's a lot, there, there are lots of issues with that and around that and you wanna be um, careful with that. So I, I personally don't feel that there is a need to fill every silence, um, but I do feel that there is a need to discuss archival silences and why um, um, perspectives are missing. So next up, I want to talk about fostering student agencies through student curated exhibits and student driven acquisitions. Um, we've been implementing uh, student curated exhibits for a while now. Um, we enjoy giving the students advocacy um, to, you know, and access to our materials and the freedom to develop their own stories with our materials. And this has been a very successful program that many instructors also enjoy working with. And we can see that the stories that the students tell in their exhibits are uh, much different <laughs> than the stories that we as curators or librarians would, would tell. So um, that has been a, a really great process and, and we love con you know, to work on this. And again, it's also this empowerment. The students really feel empowered to make the materials and the collections their own. Um, we also do a digital exhibit. You can see a few um, examples here. Um, so I've, we've been doing this for a while and I mean, it's a lot of work, but I think we've also been streamlining the process. Another uh, really favorite um, tool that I love using is student-driven acquisition. Um, again, giving em or empowering students and instructors actually to help us fill the gaps or, or bring in the perspectives that they feel are relevant to be in special collections. And this one is from a, a recent assignment uh, uh, with Professor Mika in the French department. And we together created an assignment where students were asked to identify and recommend works by female French authors during the Enlightenment period who were currently not represented in the library collection. And our head of the department, Silov Chan, was so kind to give me a certain amount, set aside a certain amount of our acquisitions budget. So the students each had to write an essay, um, find the book actually on the market, write an essay and say why it was important for the library to have that book. And we were actually in the end able to acquire all, I think five or six books that the students had put forward. And again, this is just um, another example of student agency or empowered students, but also you know, bringing in more perspectives. Um, this is another one, uh, an, a slightly older project where, again, uh, a professor, Professor Lindsay O'Neill, who teaches on the Victorian era, she, um, we didn't have, we didn't have broadsides, we didn't, you know, we had like a high culture represented, but we didn't really have a lot of like everyday, you know, people's representations. So she suggested that we get more Victorian era broadsides. So we actually pre-selected a set of from different booksellers, and then the students went in and picked their favorites, and we were able to acquire the, the um, broadsides, and they're now part of our collection. Um, so for the future, um, so these are just the things that we've been doing um, so far. For the future, I really want to assess and redesign our instruction space for more inclusivity, shifting away from the treasure room feeling. Um, you can see in the back, this is our reading room. It's gorgeous, but it's, you know, it has this, I don't know, <laughs> um, treasure room feel that, that, that doesn't make everybody feel welcome. Um, and I highly recommend, if you haven't read it, The Gentleman's Ghost, Patriarchal 
patriarchal Eurocentric legacies and special collections designed by Jesse Ryan Erickson and archives and special collections as sites of cont contestation. There are many, many other great articles in this in this book. Um, I'd also like uh, to get a more ADA compliant reading room and instruction space, um, since our furniture right now is not very movable and doesn't always accommodate people um, who need accom accommodations. Um, obviously, uh, I'd like to hire more diverse staff and faculty in special collections, as, as many of our um, special collections department, we are still a very white department. Um, I'd also love to work on bilingual information on our website and bilingual information in general, and then also to have more community-led and uh, more community-curated programming. Um, thank you so much for listening. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Michaela. And thank you to all of our presenters. That was amazing. Um, we are now going to be taking a little break, uh, about five to 10 minutes, let's say until 1140. So we have a good 20 minutes for questions. Um, let's reconvene at 1140 AM Pacific. I'm going to uh, stop the recording and also share my screen. All right, so here's some information about how to get involved with Align as well as SCA. And uh, we will see you all at 1140. Please go ahead and put some um, questions in the Q&A if you haven't already. You can do it anonymously. You can upvote other questions. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. We'll see you in a few minutes.